Today I'm going to tell you about must know clinical facts related to infectious disease and antibiotics in clinical practice. Watch to the end, a lot of providers don't know some of these facts. This video should conclude our antibiotic series. The link to the entire series is provided in the description field. Let's start. Do you know that gram-positive bacteremia should be treated with IV antibiotics for the entire course, while gram-negative bacteremia should be treated with IV antibiotics initially and then transitioned into oral antibiotics once the patient becomes clinically stable and the repeat blood cultures remain negative. Similar to gram-positive bacteremia, the following infections should receive parenteral or IV antibiotics for the entire course. Bacterial meningitis, endocarditis, ostomyelitis, epidural abscess, hardware infections, gram-negative infections that are not adequately susceptible to oral antibiotics, and the famous example is ESBL producing bacterial infections. Now, on the other hand, hepatic abscesses and empyemas uh, and septic arthritis may also require an entire course of IV antibiotics, but transition into oral antibiotics may be considered in selected stable patients. More on that later on. Do you also know that if we see staph aureus isolated from the urine culture, it's likely coming from somewhere else. Look for other sources of infections like endocarditis, epidural abscesses, etc. Always obtain two blood cultures from at least two different sites before giving antibiotics. Other cultures and sampling may need to be as well obtained like urine cultures in UTI, sputum culture in pneumonia, bone sampling in ostomyelitis, CSF analysis and culture in bacterial meningitis. At the same time, it's important to remember that we should not delay antibiotics if the patient is very ill or hemodynamically unstable if the cultures or sampling cannot be done in a timely manner. Antibiotics should be given within the first 30 to 60 minutes of presentation to the emergency room or recognizing the problem. In most cases, blood cultures and urine cultures are easy to obtain and should be done before starting antibiotics even in critically ill patients. Now, in real life practice, the following situations may represent a challenge to obtain a culture before starting antibiotics. Performing lumbar puncture or LP, which is essential in bacterial meningitis diagnosis and treatment, a delay in performing this procedure may happen because of technical difficulties or contraindications. Please do not delay giving antibiotics if this procedure cannot be done in a timely manner within the, thir the first 30 to 60 minutes. Bone sampling in ostomyelitis or discitis require IR intervention radiology or spinal surgery procedure, which most of the time needs to be scheduled the next day. It is rarely these patients become hemodynamically unstable, so we should delay giving antibiotics until sampling and culture obtained even after a day or two days as long as the patient remained hemodynamically stable. Now the same should apply to percutaneous drainage of intra-abdominal abscesses, but in reality, most of these patients receive antibiotics sooner as source control with percutaneous drainage is usually performed the next day by IR or open proce surgical procedure. Now I have to say these patients are at higher risk of being septic and critically ill compared to osteomyelitis and discitis. To conclude here, if the patient is critically ill, do not delay antibiotics regardless of the source. They should be given antibiotics within the first 30 to 60 minutes, but still need at least to obtain the blood cultures before giving the antibiotics. Let's talk about diarrhea. Diarrhea that starts while in the hospital does not need to have a stool sent for ova and parasites or a sales for Shigella, Salmonella, or Campylobacter jejuni. Instead, discontinue any laxative and stool softeners and look if it is C. diff or, or possibly just a side effects of these antibiotics. Okay, do you know what's in this picture? This is an antibiogram. It gives you great insight into the local susceptibility and resistance data of the most commonly encountered bacteria to the frequently used antibiotics and provides a great guide to empiric antibiotic selections. So please read your local antibiograms and usually pharmacy should have it. 
Now, the important question, for how long should I give antibiotics? This again depends on the type and severity of the infection and may vary from patient to patient. In general, most infections require five to seven days of antibiotics, including UTI, community acquired pneumonia, cellulitis, sinusitis, etc. Now, simple and complicated UTIs require no more than three days of antibiotics or a single dose of fospomycin. Intra-abdominal infections, including abscesses, diverticulitis, etc., require 10 to 14 days of antibiotics in total. Hospital acquired pneumonia and aspiration pneumonia require 7 to 8 days, while community acquired pneumonia usually requires 5 days worth of antibiotics. Endocarditis, osteomyelitis, and epidural abscesses as well as hardware infection requires six weeks of IV antibiotics, except in non-complicated right-sided native valve methicillin-sensitive staph aureus endocarditis, we can just treat for two weeks in such cases. And I always consult with the infectious disease team if available. Septic arthritis requires two weeks of antibiotics. In real life practice, most patients receive IV antibiotics for the entire course, but again, transition into oral antibiotics in septic arthritis is possible in some stable selected patients. Again, infected hardware requires removal of the hardware and require six weeks of IV antibiotics. Gram-positive bacteremia without associated endocarditis or osteomyelitis or epidural abscess requires two weeks of IV antibiotics. Gram-negative bacteremia also requires two weeks of antibiotics. In hepatic abscess, we treat for four to six weeks of antibiotics. The first two to four weeks, usually IV, Antibiotics, then we transition into oral antibiotics for the rest of the treatment. Again, this depends on the severity of the infection and the patient. In empyema, the same, we treat for two to four weeks directed by the severity of the infection, which also guides whether to finish the entire course with parenteral antibiotics or transition to oral antibiotics. The transition, if needed and appropriate in empyema, usually after the first two weeks of IV antibiotics treatment. How about bacterial meningitis? This again depends on the causative pathogens. Strip pneumonia and staph aureus bacterial meningitis requires two weeks of IV antibiotics. Necessaria meningitis, hemophilus influenza meningitis requires one week of IV antibiotics. Meningitis secondary to listeria and gram-negative bacilli need three weeks of IV antibiotics. Now, the duration of the course includes both IV and oral antibiotics. Let's say a patient is being discharged after receiving two days of IV antibiotics for community acquired pneumonia. We should give three more days of oral antibiotics to finish a five days course. In bacteremia, the duration should start from the time blood cultures become negative. Let's say a patient is receiving IV cefazolin for methicillin sensitive staph aureus mitral valve endocarditis. Initial blood culture, the positive blood culture was obtained on, let's say, May 1st. Repeat blood cultures performed on May 4th remain negative, so the patient should receive six weeks of antibiotics starting counting from May 4th, not May 1st. Now, don't worry, it seems a lot, right? You don't have to memorize all of that. It's all available for free on the American Society of Infectious Disease Guidelines websites or if you have up-to-date and, and other possible reliable sources. Make it a habit to refer to this website. The American um, Society of Infectious Disease Guideline website is very useful. Now, let's talk about some logistic issues in arranging outpatient IV antibiotics. Now, we decided our patient needs outpatient or long-term IV antibiotic. What's next? Please place a pick line as soon as you make that decision and do not wait to the last minute which will delay your patient discharge process. Now, patients with a history of IV drug use represent a big challenge here. Those patients absolutely cannot go home with a pick line or IV access. We either finish their course in the hospital or send them to another facility like a rehab facility, long-term acute care facility or LTAC, or a skilled nursing facility to finish their course inside these facilities. If none of those options are possible, then we have to. We have no other choice other than transition them into oral antibiotics and send them home with a good follow-up plan. This is the exception, of course, not the rule. Ideal outpatient IV antibiotics are the ones that's effective and requires the least frequent dosing and least monitoring and, of course, least side effects profile. I always get the infectious disease team, if available, at your facility so they can continue outpatient monitoring. Ceftriaxone is an optimal choice for susceptible gram-negative bacilli and streptococci. 
Ertapenem is the drug of choice if a carbapenem is needed given it's once daily dosing and the most frequent indication to use carbapenem as an outpatient are ESBL producing bacterial infections. Remember, ertapenem is not effective against Pseudomonas. Cefazolin is the one to go uh, for MSSA infections and for MRSA infections, daptomycin seems ideal. It's given once daily, but beware of its side effects, including eosinophilic pneumonia and rhabdomyolysis. Vancomycin is the other option, but require frequent dosing and monitoring. Linezolid should be avoided given its potential serious side effects with long-term use and the fact it's bacteriostatic, not bacteriocidal. At the end, I hope you found this video useful. If so, make sure to give it a like and share it with your colleagues. And if you would like to receive the F summary of this video, make sure to sign up using the link below. Thanks for watching.